City of the Jinn, a short horror story, written by Stories from the Attic, narrated by Robin McConnell. In the old stories, they came with the heat, sun burnished lands with raw blue skies, blazing days with no breath of wind. That is when they come. But those are the old stories. In reality, it's different. In reality, they come when they like. When they came for David, there were no cloudless skies. They came with the rain, in the fractured mosaic patterns of lights reflected in the sheen of puddles, tarmac slick with water, in the strange flickering shadows thrown by splintered light that falls in different ways in the rain, not that their coming surprised him. In some ways, I think he knew. It's his eyes I remember most, the way they stared, fixed and blank on something off-screen. The image itself had frozen, as it so often does on those blasted Zoom calls, usually catching you in mid-expression, eyes half shut and mouth lolling open, partway through a word, until it chooses to become unstuck and play again. It's an embarrassment we all have had to endure in the recent months. With David, though, it was different. In his frozen moment, he was caught not between expressions, or in some awkward mid-sentence gesture, but in the absolute fullness of one. He was captured on screen at the precise moment that a single, pure, and unaltered emotion washed over him. It was terror. Staring past the camera toward what I assumed to be the corner of the room, he had spent the final seconds before the stream halted, jabbering nonsensically so that the noises he made were not so many words coming from his mouth as sounds dribbling over the lips the way a toddler's babbles might. His hands had slowly ridden up into a strange claw-like position, as if he were desperately pushing against or repelling something whilst his lips had drawn back tightly over the teeth, but it was his eyes his eyes that I remember most of all. At that moment, David's eyes bulged so wide that the whites were clearly visible, surrounding the iris like a blank sea of milk, speaking in their silent emptiness of things that could never truly be described in words. That look, though, that look, said it all. That was five months ago. Hearing me say that I considered myself agnostic, a well-meaning but admittedly overzealous evangelical friend of mine once told me that It doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. He believes in you. At the time, slightly taken aback by her grinning insistence, I had simply tried to brush over the comment. I had smiled politely and attempted to change the topic without dwelling too much on exactly what she meant by it. She presumably realising she was onto a lost cause, had allowed me to do so, and soon we were talking about something completely different. It wasn't until after David's disappearance that that quote suddenly came back to me, not as any kind of religious epiphany, or prompt to fall to my knees and pray, but as a niggling, squirming thought that I couldn't quite dismiss. What, I wondered, if the same were true, but of darker things? What if, as seems to have been the case for David, scepticism or downright denial is no protection? What if the things that have haunted the dreams of men for centuries, things far older than our supposed rationalism, don't care if we believe? What if, rather, they regard our disbelief with mocking indifference? In recent weeks I asked my friend these questions, this time it was her turn to smile politely and change the subject, only replying cryptically that If a child in a dark forest says he doesn't believe in ghosts, it doesn't stop the wolves from eating him. Stories can't hurt you, but sometimes shadows can. Having heard her say this, I was glad she changed the subject. Neither David nor I have ever been what I would call superstitious types. 
It is one of the very few things that the two of us had in common. However, over the months that I spent talking to David on those interminable Zoom calls, I heard the closest thing to a real ghost story that I have ever heard, and certainly the only one I ever came close to believing. Not that David's stories were about ghosts, exactly. His stories, his paranoia, which seemed to increase with every day and every call, was attributed not to ghosts, but to the jinn. It is a curious feature of Western culture that we deal with the things that frighten us by turning them into a joke, by lampooning, mocking, or exaggerating the terrors that give us sleepless nights. We stretch them out of proportion to the extent that they eventually become comical, lose their potency, and cease to hold any real danger. For evidence of this amelioration process, we need only look at the figure of the vampire, which, as a shadowy denizen of folklore and woodcuts, terrorised the imaginations of Europeans for centuries. Now, in the 21st century, the vampire is a figure of fun, a costume for children to wear at Halloween, a character on Sesame Street, and a cultural archetype which, though it has fangs, has no real bite. Unless, of course, they are real. In the East, this process also exists in some cases, but not for all. Whereas for Westerners the character of the genie is often a colourful, comic character, which, stretched into the form of some crude orientalist stereotype, graces the stage of pantomimes or writhes and balls in flashy cartoons, in the East it is quite different. The first time I used the word jinn in the company of my Muslim friends, the entire table went silent. Friends, who moments earlier had been laughing and sharing food, now put down the dishes, stopped their chatter, and stared at me with straight faces and serious, worried expressions. To them, the jinn are not a joke. Some, admittedly, did try to laugh it off, though the gesture was unconvincing and seemed to stem more from a desire to move past the subject than any real mirth. Others, clearly somewhat offended that I used the word at the dinner table, asked angrily why I said that word in their presence. Whilst others of a less religious persuasion, but nonetheless of Middle Eastern origin, warned me that I should be careful what I chose to discuss, and that perhaps I should not speak lightly of things I didn't understand. I had been taken aback by what I recognised as real trepidation. I inquired as to why these people, some of whom I knew to be scientists and doctors, others of whom I knew to be sceptics, would become so nervous around what was essentially just a story. The point, one close friend clarified, was that, to her, it wasn't a story at all. The jinn, she said, are not to be spoken of lightly. You must remember that devout Muslims believe that the Quran is the unaltered word of God. If the Quran says that the jinn are real, then they are real, and therefore they are to be feared. The jinn, I should explain, are entities that exist in the mythology and theology of the Middle and Near East, equivalent in some ways to the idea of a genie and in other variations closer to a demon or spirit. The jinn are considered to be another category of God's creation alongside man and angels. Unlike man, who was created from clay or dust, the jinn are thought to have been created from smokeless flame. They inhabit the wildernesses and barren places of the earth. In ancient times it was traditional amongst some desert-dwelling cultures to leave rotten meat or particularly the bones of animals that had been consumed at designated points in the desert for the jinn to feed upon. Depending on the tradition, jinn are said to envy or even openly despise humanity, which some attribute to the fact that Allah favours humans above them. Certainly, in pre-Islamic traditions in Arabia, they were considered malevolent, being the cause of mental illnesses, possessions, and sleep paralysis. The jinn, as my friend alluded to, also exist within Islamic theology. They are mentioned twenty-nine separate times in the Holy Quran, and it was believed that the Prophet was sent to deliver his message not only to humans, but also to communities of the jinn. What is surprising to some is just how seriously this belief is taken. Whereas literal belief in demons and spirits is considered to be an antiquated view in many religious communities, 
belief in the jinn not only persists, but flourishes. In many countries, if they are spoken of at all, they are not discussed in terms of abstract characters or myths, but as entities that are very much real and part of daily life. Whilst some modern Islamic scholars believe references to the jinn in the Quran are to be taken metaphorically and represent something unseen or insubstantial, belief in the literal existence of these entities is extremely high in many Muslim-majority countries. A survey conducted as recently as 2012 by the Pew Research Center revealed that as many as 86% of Muslims in Morocco, 84% in Bangladesh, and similarly high figures in other countries believe wholeheartedly that the jinn do exist and interact with humanity in a literal, physical sense. As my friend and many others since have reminded me, the jinn are to be feared. Hearing what became of David, I am inclined to agree. It had started in the spring of 2020. Having already been in southern Turkey when the pandemic really hit the UK, David had somehow convinced the university funding board that not only was he better off staying in the area for health reasons and to avoid inconvenience associated with getting him home, but that he should also be allowed to remain there on full pay to continue his research. Since he was going to be stuck in that part of the world anyway, he had persuaded them that owing to a lack of flights, not to mention the fact that at the time Turkey was recording far lower infection rates than Britain, that it made sense that he should be allowed to finish up his work. Or so he said. Of course, we all knew it was a lie. For whilst David was a thorough and, shall we say, opinionated archaeologist and historian, it was clear to everyone but the funding board that he had not gone into the area in search of any great historical discovery, nor did his wish to remain there stem from any desire to complete research or contribute anything new to the field. He simply wanted leave to remain so that he could continue to pursue his real reason for going in the first place, a reason we all knew as the Beetle. Not that he got away scot-free, as a sort of indirect penance for having blatantly lied to the funding board about his motivations, David was obliged to conduct a number of Zoom calls over the course of each week. These mandated meetings were prescribed by the funding board as a way for him to feed back his findings and day-to-day activities to a panel made up of representatives from various departments, including professors from Near Eastern Studies, Archaeology, and Comparative Religions. Unfortunately for me, the appointed representatives from most of those departments were all too aware that David's little jolly was a sham, which, coupled with the fact that most also disliked him personally, on account of his brash arrogance and acid tongue, meant that his penance suddenly became mine. As a postgrad studying for my PhD, it was decided that I would benefit greatly from regular meetings with such an esteemed professor, and that my much applauded attention to detail was just what was needed to ensure that whatever David had to share could be noted down accurately and presented to the others without any need for them to actually be there. So it was that three times a week, Professor David Warwick and I, neither of whom wanted to be there and both of whom knew the meeting was pointless, would sit down over Zoom or Skype to discuss his non-existent research and findings. As you can imagine, the meetings were far from a blast. In David's head, or at least in the image he had conjured and shared boastfully to his jealous colleagues at the university, Mesopotamia was a land of yellow sands and hazy blue skies where deserts and plateaus stretched out to the horizon, whispering of history, opportunity, and discovery. It was also, he reminded us whilst unashamedly gloating, an area of the world which at the time was not subject to the lockdown restrictions imposed upon us back in Britain. Having arrived in the city of Mardin, however, David was displeased to find that rather than the sun-drenched sandstone buildings and bustling coffee shops he had seen in the photographs, he had been greeted by a sodden and grey-skied town, in which many businesses had temporarily closed up on account of the rain. Whilst the restrictions he had so cheerfully laughed about having avoided were to catch up with him a few weeks later, it was the constant downpours that put a dent in his plans. Water he reliably informed me, disturbed the soil, and therefore also the insects. Shepherds and livestock farmers kept their livestock inside, and therefore there was less dung for the beetles to collect. 
I'll admit that this discussion of dung beetles and their habits was not exactly what I got into academia for, and often, whilst David prattled on about the details, I was far less than what you might call fully engaged. It is also true, however, that trapped as he was indoors with only the grey skies and the sounds of rain for company, David seemed to regard me as somewhat of an outlet, if not a confidant. Once the obligatory summations of his research were over, often brief on account of there being extraordinarily little actual research taking place, he would fill the rest of the time by regaling me with stories from his past, detailing his daily adventures in the city, and generally treating the call as if it were some sort of social catch-up. I think it would be fair to say that for the time we spent together on those calls, I was, at least to some extent, the closest thing David had to a friend. It didn't matter to him that I was half asleep when he prattled on about this or that dragonfly or a spider he had once caught in Namibia. He did, however, notice how I perked up when he mentioned the emerald beetle, and particularly the city of Nusaibin. It should be mentioned at this point that David's fascination with insects was, of course, his true reason for remaining in Turkey. An avid collector of all things crawling, he had spent many a happy summer scouring the rocks, nooks and crannies of Middle Eastern and African countries in search of rare species that he could then capture, kill, and eventually pin to a backboard for display. So obsessed was he with these creatures that even the dull-looking accommodation in which he is staying during our conversations had around two dozen framed examples on the wall behind him, specimens that he had presumably carried with him on the way to Turkey, and had them mounted on the walls to decorate his dwelling. A dwelling that I was soon to learn was not quite where it should have been. According to the applications he had filed with the university, David's research was meant to be taking place in a city called Mardin in the southeast of Turkey. Mardin, and particularly the old city, is a beautiful place, nestled on the top of a hill, and comprised of buildings elaborately carved from dusky orange sandstone. In the sunlight, the place has a magical appearance, and is for all the world the picture of Near Eastern beauty one imagines when thinking of Mesopotamia. It is home to a number of important religious sites, including a mosque that claims to have a footprint of the Prophet Muhammad, and a number of Orthodox Christian churches used by a small surviving community of the Assyrian ethnic group. It was in this area, and on this particular subject, that David's research was supposedly taking place, the university presumably not having noticed that all of the churches in this part of Turkey were ordered closed due to Covid, or they were assuming that David was somehow able to get around these restrictions. He wasn't. In fact, after a few calls, I began to realise that David was not in Mardin at all. On the morning of one of our meetings, I went directly from a call with a friend to my scheduled call with David. What David had no way of knowing was that my friend Gabriel lived in Mardin, had conducted the meeting from his balcony, and was sitting in the blazing sunshine. David, however, was huddled in a cold-looking flat before a window that showed a scene of persistent rain falling from a slate-grey sky. It didn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out which of the two was lying. So where are you really? I asked David after a few minutes of nonsense about his supposed research. David went silent and regarded me suspiciously. I saw his lips begin to form the shape of an M as he began to say Mardin, and decided to press my advantage by interrupting. Don't say Mardin, because I've just got off the phone call with someone who lives there, and it's a beautiful sunny day. Either you have a very localised rain cloud over your head, like something from a comic book, or you're not in Mardin. So where are you? For a moment, David looked stern, but then he broke into a sly-looking grin, and leaning conspiratorially closer to the camera, whispered, Can you keep a secret? I did not mirror his smile, but instead remained stone-faced. David, I'm wearing earphones, there's no need to whisper, I mentioned flatly. Good, he responded, before hesitating. You're not recording this, are you? Again, I remained stoically straight-faced, though his paranoia was deeply amusing to me. Why in Christ's name would I want to do that? I said, eventually breaking into a smile. There was something deeply comical about how excited he was by this whole conversation. Before announcing his location, he looked cautiously back over his shoulder. Then he said it. Nusabin. 
From the way in which I raised my eyebrow, it was obvious to David that I had heard of the place, and was somewhat taken aback by his being there. It was at this point that David's search for an elusive beetle and my own research into the mythologies of the Near East intersected. Nisabin, I should explain, is a town in southeastern Turkey that lies virtually on the Syrian border. My first response to hearing that David had holed up there was to object on behalf of the university. The government advises that you shouldn't visit Nisabin. The place is in red on the Home Office website and that means all of your insurance would be invalid. David responded by quipping that in a time of Covid, the space outside your front door is considered dangerous and off-limits by the British government. He had no intention of getting hurt in a way that would require him to call upon the insurance provided by the university, which of course would no longer cover him, and had, he assured me, taken out his own insurance, just in case. Having made this declaration, David proceeded to hook my interest by prodding at a subject he knew would be intriguing to me. I thought you would be pleased that I was in New Sabin. It's supposed to be the city of the djinn. Isn't that the sort of hocus-pocus stuff you work on? I gritted my teeth, steadying myself for a moment before offering an answer, knowing as I did that David was fully aware of my work on the djinn, having sat through one of my terminal presentations on exactly that subject a few months before he disappeared on his insect-scouting pleasure trip. Eventually I confirmed that, yes, I had written a few papers on the mythology in its intersection with religious beliefs in that area, and that, yes, Nusabin was known as the City of the Jinn, and was supposed to be where the jinn that spoke to the Prophet directly were from. I explained that there was a religious site in Gurnavaz close to Nusabin, believed to be the burial place of the Prince of the Jinn, and that believers from a number of different faiths including Yazidis and Syriacs visit this place because it is believed that it can help to heal mental health issues. David laughed at my stories and countered with one of his own, assuring me that, You're going to love this! I remained fairly confident that I wouldn't. He then went on to explain how on a clear day he had headed out alone into the flat barren plains, close to the border with Syria, in search of the emerald back beetle, a variety of dung beetle of which he had been trying to obtain a specimen for over twenty years. Whilst not exactly the desert that one pictures when you think of the rolling sand dunes of Arabia, it's a word that probably describes the open, barren landscape around some parts of Nusabin. On my own, sanctioned visit to the area a few years ago, I was impressed by these desolate stretches that seemed to simply vanish into the distance, blurring the horizon into a hazy wash of grey and white, rather than the definite ruled line you might expect. That David had been wandering around this area with very few landmarks and even less signposting, particularly in sections close to the heavily monitored border with Syria, seemed reckless and likely to get him questioned by police or any army personnel that happened to see him meandering aimlessly. As it happened, the only person he had encountered was an old man who had been engaged in a similar pursuit and was seemingly just walking in this barren corner of the city just for the sake of walking. Meeting David who at six feet four, with a mop of silver-white hair and a complexion the colour of yoghurt, stood out like a sore thumb, he had questioned him as to what he was expecting to find out there. David, displaying the sort of honesty and candour he did not share with the funding board, explained that he was here in search of the emerald back, and that if he were to find one, it would complete his collection. The old man, David explained, was taken aback and seemingly quite shaken by this. He discouraged David in the strongest possible terms and pointed repeatedly to a strip of cloth that he had tied around his wrist. At first, David was not able to understand exactly what the man was trying to communicate, but eventually was able to decipher that in the old man's opinion, catching and killing a dung beetle would put him in danger of retaliation from the djinn. David stopped at this point, clearly seeing the incredulity manifest on my face. It was not a belief that I had ever come across, but with a little explanation I did begin to see a link. He said that the djinn feed on camel dung, that the beetles that collect and roll this material are friends or helpers of the djinn, and that to interfere with them can be dangerous because they can become vengeful. David smiled, a broad, toothy smile, clearly pleased that he had been able to enlighten me on my own specialist subject. Trying not to let him see that I was too interested, if not slightly peeved that he might have stumbled upon some folk tradition that I had not previously known about, I smiled and supported his idea. 
According to the tradition, the jinn asked the prophet what they were allowed to eat, and one of the things he told them they could eat was camel dung. I've never heard the tradition that by extension this means you should show some reverence to the beetles that collect it for the jinn, but it's an interesting extension of the idea. David nodded, clearly happy that he had finally said something that could actually be of some academic merit, even if it was in my work rather than his. Before letting him go that afternoon, I further explained that the fabric around the old man's wrist could have come from Girnavaz. Displaying for the first time something that at least approached genuine interest, he asked me to explain. I told him that at the foot of the hill that leads up to the tomb of the supposed Prince of the Jinn is a tree. This wish tree stands outside the tomb of another jinn and is covered with strips of fabric. The ritual for making a wish, usually for a cure to some illness or mental health issue, is to remove a strip of fabric already on the tree and, after saying the appropriate prayer, replace it with a brand new piece. The original strip is then kept by the believer as a talisman against attacks from the jinn. It may have been one of these strips that the old man was wearing. Though I hadn't imagined it possible, David's grin somehow expanded even further as he laughed that he probably should have taken a piece from the old man as protection. Particularly after this. Oh, the genies are coming for me now, eager Ford, holding up a gorgeously iridescent specimen of a beetle. Well, it was worth it. Isn't she magnificent? You found it? I asked, shocked. David nodded and did not even offer a verbal reply. Instead, he simply stared, transfixed at the multicolored glow from the back of the beetle, and, leaning over, pressed the button to end the call. Typical David, I thought. The next time David called, his mood had changed considerably. Before I could even begin to get settled and ask him about his day, he began speaking in a hurried, almost desperate tone. It had been three days since we had last spoken, and from the way he appeared on screen it seemed that David had not slept for one of them. That that place, the one you talked about with the rags, the bits of cloth on the tree that you can take and keep as, as what, protection? Where was it? I mean, how do I get there if I were interested or if I wanted to see the place, you know, out of curiosity, or just if, if, if I wanted to go, if I needed to go there, how? How do I get there? I waited a moment to make sure that he had finished before answering, saying that I would send him the address and location before asking why, exactly, he had taken a sudden interest in mythology. At first, he attempted to shrug the question off, parrying it with his usual arrogant bluster. Oh, you know, it's always good to explore this sort of stuff, and if I can steal some of your thunder on the topic, then all the better. He tried to laugh, but the sound came out empty, and what flashed momentarily onto his lips looked more like a plea than a smile. He hesitated, stared into the camera with an expression that is hard to describe, except to say that it looked somehow hollow. David swallowed hard before hesitantly continuing. Well, he half said, half coughed. The truth is I haven't quite felt myself these past few days, he paused. Or nights. I noticed as he spoke that his eyes were never still. They were constantly throwing furtive, expectant glances around the room to areas off camera. I think it's probably the rain, you know, this damned rain. It just, it won't stop. And everything is grey and dull and awful. It's enough to get anyone down. At this, he rose from his seat, lifting the laptop so that it rose jerkily with him, and I was treated to a swirling tour of his small apartment and eventually a view out of his window. I could see the sodden outlines of the city, square and rectangular houses with flat roofs, ill-equipped for the downpours, swimming in moisture. They stood out in stark silhouette against the beige, off-white expanse behind. The plains, empty and desolate, stretched away as far as the eye could see, and blended seamlessly into the clouds. It's been like this for days, just rain and dogs all the time. He rested the laptop on the table, and with only half of his face still in shot, rubbed one hand wearily through his hair. Dogs, I replied, confused. Yes, he sighed, a long exhausted sigh. 
I mean, usually they bark or howl at night. One will start and then another will bark back, but now it's different. I shifted in my chair, trying to make sense of exactly what had affected David so badly, certain that it wasn't the rain. I was just standing here, he said, by the window, just looking out, you know, at the town and the rain. It was evening and far away, right at the edge of where the buildings stop and the desert starts. I could hear this dog barking and howling. I nodded, though I had no idea where he was going with this story. Then another one starts up. But the thing was, it, it wasn't random. It was a dog a little bit closer, like the next house or the next street along. The box was slightly louder and clearer than the next started, and the next. He turned into the screen, so that I could now see most of his face, the window a huge rectangle of muted grey behind him. I just stood there watching, and the box got louder and closer, like they were starting and stopping, row by row, street by street, and just edging, creeping closer. It was like watching a wave, a tsunami or something coming towards you, but instead of the crest of the wave being visible, it was made by sound, like someone was walking past each yard, and each dog as they did so. They were setting the next one off, going mad, getting closer and closer to my window. I watched as David turned right the way around, and looked again out of the window as if surveying the street below. Then the ones closest, below the window or in the houses just underneath, they started howling, baying like they were being hurt or something. I tried to go to bed, but it just carried on and on. Well, obviously it kept me up. Eventually I came to the window to see what was going on. It was night time by then, but... He trailed off. He raised his hand to his mouth and bit down hard on the knuckle. The next time he spoke, I could see that his bottom lip was trembling. He swallowed hard. I looked out, just to see what they were barking at or howling for. It was still pouring down, just sheets and sheets of rain, but apart from the dogs, everything was quiet. There wasn't a soul about, and the whole place just looked empty, but then I looked out, towards the end of the street, and there was this figure. At first I thought it was a local woman in a burqa or khador or whatever, you know, the black shroud that covers everything from head to toe. Some women here do wear them, but... Then I thought, why would she just be standing there in the rain, just letting it soak her through? And then I looked at the streetlight, and it dawned on me that it couldn't be a woman, because whoever it was came almost up to the bulb of the light, and that's about seven or eight feet from the floor. Nobody's that tall. But there it was, like the shape of a person under this jet-black veil, like a sheet hanging all the way from the head to the floor so that you couldn't see the face or the shape of the body or anything. And then... Then I saw its hands. They were huge and stupidly long. Each finger must have been almost thirty centimetres and and just just horrible, thin. I, I just... It was just standing there, waiting in the rain while the dogs kept howling and it kept watching, just standing there, watching. David ended the call. The next time he called, the last time, it was to my personal Skype account. It was around 11pm, which would be 1am where he was. The image on the screen was erratic, bouncing around as he was obviously moving the laptop. He held the camera up to the window. There, he screeched. There, can you see it? It's there on the corner. The image was blurred, but I could just about make out the streetlight, obscured by rain and the reflection from the window. There, he repeated, shouting wildly. It's there. It's waiting. Oh, God, it's waiting for me. The laptop turned. I caught a glimpse of David's face staring off-camera into the corner of the room. Then the screen froze. When the jinn asked Muhammad what they were allowed to eat, he told them that they were permitted to eat camel dung and the bones of animals. I never heard from David again, 
but a month later it was announced that his remains had been discovered in Nusaybin. They were found in the desert area, close to the border with Syria. I use the words remains rather than body, because what was retrieved did not really constitute a body. What the authorities found of him was a limp, gelatinous mass, as if his innards had been wrapped in a sacking made of leather. Taken for examination, empty of structure, was the skin, flesh, and organs of Professor David Warwick, still intact, with no sign of any entry wounds or interference. What actually became of him is not known, save for the fact that every bone in his body had somehow been removed. This has been City of the Jinn, a short horror story, written by Stories from the Attic, narrated by Robin McConnell, copyright 2021 by Michael Vandervoort, production copyright by Michael Vandervoort.